From New York, Black Journal, this evening, with Dick Gregory, political humorist, Jack Anderson, syndicated columnist, Billy Taylor and his band, and now the host and executive producer, Tony Brown. game. Uh, thank you very much for being with us on Black Journal this evening. I think we have a very unusual show. Before we begin the show, <clears throat> I would like to offer uh, airtime to uh, members of the officials, rather, of the CIA and of uh, the FBI and any other intelligence agencies to respond to things that they will hear on the program on this edition. Uh, I think it's very significant that we have not had a number of national programs dealing as current an issue as the CIA revelations and the new uh, domestic surveillance situation is. So we felt that we on Black Journal would take up the void and uh, give to America some type of investigation. And in order to do that, we will approach it comedically uh, with uh, my co-host, Mr. Dick Gregory. <laughs> and we will deal with it in a very serious vein uh, by having our other guest uh, explain certain things that he's already exposed and perhaps things that he has not. America's number one investigative reporter, the syndicated columnist, Mr. Jack Anderson. And speaking of syndicated columnists, we have with us in the audience one of our own, uh, one of the very best syndicated columnists. Let me just for a second uh, give you the benefit of something we're, we've, we're doing, which will be on the air in uh, a couple of weeks. We've created a game show called Can You Dig It? It's, it's a game show. Uh, the difference in this game show and most game shows is the body of information is about Afro-American experience. And uh, one of the questions we asked the contestants uh, in this game show was, who <clears throat> was what, rather, well-known black syndicated columnist was also the first black deputy mayor, police uh, deputy commissioner of police in New York City? And the answer to that is the gentleman who's with us. Let me introduce Mr. Billy Rowe. We will be right black after this message. Um, before I introduce my co-host, I'd like to um, just say a few things about him. There's really not much that can be said that hasn't already been said. He's one of the very best-known uh, people in the country in a number of varieties. In addition to being an extremely good comedian, he's, uh, I think we could say, a, a very spectacular social commentator. Ladies and gentlemen, may you welcome with me my co-host, Mr. Dick Gregory. Oh. Wow. 
Wow, wow, y'all sure look good. Thank you very much. And Tony, it's nice being with you. I, I, I was late getting here. I, uh, I had to fly to Chicago. I have a strange cousin that lives in Chicago that once a year, he never tells me till a week before time, once a year he takes a day to go out to the cemetery and visits his wife's grave. And he always wants me to go with him. And when he go visit his wife's grave, he's not like most guys that visit his wife's grave and put flowers on it. He go out and lay another ton of dirt on it. <laughs> no. I never realized how much he hated her until when we went to the cemetery the first time. The first time in my life I seen somebody at the cemetery tip the grave digger. Right. <laughs> and I like Chicago. I, I used to live in Chicago. I don't live there now. But Chicago is a strange town. It's like uh, people's uptight because, you see, living in Chicago, you have to live with the thought that Mrs. O'Leary's cow burnt that whole town down to the ground. I mean, can you imagine living in a city where a dumb cow had wiped it out? But you know what I believe? I believe one day with the right investigation, we'll find out that maybe Mrs. O'Leary's cow didn't do it. We might find out that Mrs. O'Leary got drunk one night and went out in the barn and milked the bull by mistake. <laughs> but everything, the whole world's gone crazy. I'm so glad that Watergate is over. I'm telling you, you know, people walk up and say, well, what do you think about Dick Nixon? Well, it had to happen. Anytime the president of the United States' best friend named B.B. <laughs> you know, the great thing that happened in the black community, and, well, I don't have to tell you, you know, in the black community, we were so happy when Watergate broke that all the black leaders in America sent Dick Nixon a telegram thanking him for not having no blacks in the administration. Yeah, can't blame Watergate on us. Had it been one black, no, no, had it just been a rumor, we'd have got all the blame. I can just see Liddy standing in court. Uh, Judge Sirica, Your Honor, uh, Jabbo Jones did it all by himself. And Judge Sirica saying, can you explain to me how one man can bug the whole Watergate by himself? Say, did it with a watermelon, Judge. <laughs> yeah, that's why many blacks like myself, we're so glad young white kids is on the scene today because, see, young white kids don't be lying on us 24 hours a day like a lot of them old white folks used to do. 24 hours a day, a lot of them old white folks just be bad-mouthing us and talking about the way we look, talking about the way we talk. The colors got them big old funny-looking lips. You know, that used to have a lot of effect on some blacks, walk around all day with their lips tucked in. walking around with 40 pounds of meat in his mouth. <laughs> he had nerve enough to bad mouth the way we talk. You know them colors just can't speak no English at all, which ain't never bothered me. I ain't got no English blood in me. <laughs> and what little bit of English I do talk, the reason it sounds so bad, I learned all my English from a bad English-speaking white boy. <laughs> and you can check that out for yourself. When they first brought me over here on the big boat, I wasn't speaking nothing but pure Swahili. Till that dumb white boy looked at me one day and said, go over yonder and get that bell cop and bring over y'all. I've been talking like them ever since. And so I said, you don't know what a breath of fresh air these young white kids on the scene today because them old white folk could lie. I mean, it got so bad where I live, they had nerve enough to try to blame slavery on us. <laughs> Just look you right in your eyes and tell you, we didn't have anything to do with it. We went over there to Africa to get some elephants. Niggas just jumped on the ship. <laughs> Let's see that now. Take me, Guama. <laughs> get back, boys. Elephants we want. <laughs> oh, Guama, take me. All right, boy, if you insist, get up on the boat. Anything else you want me to do for you? Uh, yes, sir, put a chain around my leg so I won't slip off. I don't know. Whole world gone crazy. I'm so glad the CIA is getting exposed for all that wiretapping and bugging and can You see, every government agency in this country taps my phone. I got so many government agents laying in my bushes with tape recorders. I had a friend of mine came by my house when and said, hey, man, you got bushes look just like feet. <laughs> I said, I got some bushes I'm going to cut one day, too. Yeah, you know, you know, I can always tell when the CIA is in the audience following me. It's always the young cat with the brand new beard, price tag hanging down. You know, they are so stupid. That's why they keep getting caught. And everybody, you know, everybody wonders, well, why don't you do something about them tapping your phone, Dick? Anytime the government's tapping your phone and you know they're tapping it, you can have more fun with them than they can have with you. Yeah. yeah. 
Like when I leave this show, I'm going to go to the phone, call my wife long distance. When she pick up the phone, I'm going to read the alphabets off to her backwards. <laughs> and they'd be up. That's right. All right. That's right. They'd be up for four days trying to crack that code. <laughs> hey, they plotting something big. I don't know. You know, my lawyers really get uptight. They say, you know, uh, you know, why do you do this? I mean, why do you let them tap? I say, it don't bother me. Now, I explained this on a talk show that the CIA was tapping my phone. And the, the cat got very uptight. He says, Mr. Gregory, I defy you to accuse the United States government, the CIA, of bugging your phone. What evidence do you have? I said, what well, evidence is my phone. He said, you have to have hard evidence to get on a nationwide television show and accuse the government of tapping your phone. Now, what evidence do you have? What day did you find out your phone was tapped? I said, one day I got ready to call my brother and picked up the phone. He was already on the line. <laughs> And he ain't got no telephone. <laughs> you know, that wasn't enough. The guy still looked at me and said, that's not enough evidence to accuse the United States government of tapping your phone. Now, withdraw that statement or show me hardcore evidence. I said, I'll, I'll give it to you. I know the government's tapping my phone. Anytime a black cat in America can owe Bell Telephone $12,000 and they don't cut the phone off, it's tapped. <laughs> I don't know, but like I said, the whole world's crazy. Things is getting bad. And all y'all that had a big old meal for Christmas and had seven courses, I hope you got a picture of it. <laughs> and no, things is, things is, the economy's bad. I mean, I can tell things is bad because I travel a lot every day and getting on planes and a lot of them business executives be talking to me. You know, and you can tell things is bad and you be sitting on a plane and a white cat run over to you and say, how you doing, my brother? <laughs> all at once is our country now, our economy. I said, well, I'm doing all right, just trying to get me a little sleep. He said, how can you sleep during these trying times? <laughs> I said, like what? He says, well, it's all this have to affect the black community. I said, like what? He said, like the tight money. I said, man, we didn't have none of that when it was loose. <laughs> said, what about the high interest rate? I said, how high did it go? He said, 12 and a half percent. I said, we wonder when it got so low. <laughs> in 1949, they charged my mother 57% interest on a television set with the knobs missing. <laughs> I don't, but you know when you can tell things is bad? You know why you can tell things is bad? Because the older folks have stopped lying to the kids. Yeah, you dig it? You don't see no old folks in America running around talking about the good old days and now it look like they're coming back. <laughs> see, I'm 43 years old. I remember those good old days. Only thing good about the good old days was they left. Yeah, boy, when I was a kid, we were so poor and hungry and raggedy. Best day we had in my house was Halloween. Yeah, that's the day you could wear your natural clothes and everybody thought you was dressed for the occasion. Oh, yeah. Woo, look at Richard. Got on shoes. Look just like feet. And look at the cost of living. Food so high as dirt and it's cheaper to eat money. That's right. I went to the supermarket with my wife three weeks ago. We shopped, checked out, clerk figured it up. So that'd be $85. I paid him. He looked at me right now and told me, where you want me to put the groceries? I said, put them right here in my pocket. <laughs> and can you believe the price of sugar? Have you checked out sugar? I'm going to make a prediction. Sugar is so high that I predict if sugar keep going up in the next 18 months, the way it did the last 12 months, I predict that guys that's pushing dope today will stop pushing dope and start pushing sugar. <laughs> Can you imagine, can you imagine living in a society with sugar pushes? Can you imagine all them sugar junkies out on the corner with a cup of coffee trying to get a fix? <laughs> can you imagine we'll have to have an all new police department? Can you imagine cats being hired and call themselves sugar busters? <laughs> now that's not funny because here's a change you have to make. You know the narcotic squad today have sophisticated means of busting narcotics. I, you, do you know they have dogs that sniff out marijuana? Now, you know dogs can't smell sugar, so they'd have to get cockroaches. So, <laughs> can you imagine the cat standing on the corner and they think he's a sugar pusher and they lay five cockroaches on him? <laughs> but you could always tell the sugar pushers standing on the corner because those be the cats standing out there with a can of black flag hanging out their pocket. <laughs> Which black flag works now on cockroaches. When I was a kid, we had cockroaches so big they would send you to get the black flag. That's right. That's right. Black flag didn't do nothing to cockroach when I was a kid, but get them high. I never forget one day cockroach ran across the room. I got a can of black flag and nailed him between the eyes. Easy looked at me and said, thanks, man. I needed that. 
Go sir. way back, don't we? Uh huh. I sure look good, uh, man. You do. I mean, you know, we, we 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 all looking good now. We got you here. Oh, thank you. Up here in New York, New York. What'd you say? Where are you on your way? Oh, I got to go into Nashville and speak, and then leave there and go to Chicago later tonight. You were recently were um, at the uh, World Conference on uh, Food, food in, in Rome. Rome. Yeah. What was your? Uh, well, did you have an official status? If you no. didn't have an official status, what were you doing there, etc.? Well, you know, I really wasn't planning on going. But, you know, I got so insulted that the United States delegation did not make a commitment. And we're talking about people starving right now. We're talking about a world where there's a half a billion people that could be dead from starvation in the next six months. And I'm just insulted living in a nation that can send tanks around the world but can't send turnips, that can supply the whole world with napalm but not fertilizer. And I just, I just went over to the conference to say to the people in the conference and to the entire world that there's a whole lot of Americans that feel like myself that believe we should have sent humanitarians instead of politicians. And that there's a whole lot of people that want to deal with the food program in America from a humanitarian standpoint. And that is feed the world, wipe out hunger. You see, and I feel that if we can raise the conscience level of the masses of people, and regardless of what we say about this country, there's more decent people in this country than negative folks. It's just the fact that when the conscience level get raised, that the American people will rally to it. And it was very much evidence. And I, I would say one of the grandest days in the history of this country happened on the 21st of December, 1974. Over half a million young people in this country went on a fast for 24 hours and sent their money to feed the hungry people. Now, it's beautiful to send in money to feed hungry people, but when you give up eating for 24 hours a day, you bring Bangladesh to your belly, right. and then you can start seeing the problems. And this is what we went over there for. You know, I ran from Chicago to Washington, D.C. last summer to try to dramatize to the American people that, you know, there is a critical food shortage. We might have to change our diet. We even have to look and see if conspiracy is involved in it. You see, we had enough grain in this country to feed the world 10 times around. Now, I don't believe it's an accident that the United States Weather Bureau did not know we were going to have a vicious drought last summer and a vicious early freeze. Now, I'm not talking about that little dude that gives the weather report on the news. I'm not our 6 o'clock friend. That's our 6 o'clock friend. <laughs> you know, I don't even know how he keep his job. What's it you were telling me about how... how <laughs> I know. I mean, if he was black, he'd have been fired a long time ago. For being wrong. For being wrong. Yeah, he said, it's going to be a good day. The whole weekend going to be good. And you go out on a picnic and it's snow in your basket, man. And he'd be on the news that night. Ha ha, I missed another one. You know? and, and the thing I don't dig about it, you see, I, you know, I believe that the one thing we have to get is a black news person, man or woman. That's the one thing in the news that, that white folk can't relate with us. Because down in the ghetto, under that pressure, barometric pressures don't mean nothing to me. Wind velocities don't mean nothing to me. And see, see, if there was a brother or a sister given the weather, and you woke up in the morning, and it was 22 below zero, you would know it because they wouldn't show up. Their car don't start <laughs> when it get that cold, right? <laughs> and, so, and so this is what we were trying to say on the run. Knowing that the United States Weather Bureau has the weather pattern for the next 10, 15 years at the least, then why would we dump our grain to Russia? Now, that was an interesting wheat deal. We sold a billion dollars worth of wheat, and a billion is a million, million. A billion dollars worth of wheat to Russia on credit with a stipulation they don't have to pay us back for 30 years. The day before we made the deal, wheat sold for a dollar. 65 a bushel. The day after it sold for 365 a bushel, now it floats between six and seven dollars a bushel. And we say the Arabs is manipulating the oil for political reasons. I say they learn it from us. And it's one thing somebody tampering with some gasoline, I got to feed a dead automobile. It's something else somebody tampering with my dinner, I got to feed live human beings. And so I'm very concerned with the food situation in America and the world. It affects the poor people in America, it affects the poor people in the world. But I think once 
the American people find out the diet pattern, that once we learn how to eat for nutrition and not for taste, once we understand that almost a fourth of all the grain produced in this country is used for the manufacturing of alcohol, there's a whole lots of people, once they know this, now hearing me say it don't mean nothing. When the government puts this out, then there's a whole lots of people would gladly give up drinking three days a week, four days a week. Some people that can't stop, but for that reason they could. Well, Dick, I was thinking, excuse me for interrupting, I was thinking that for years you've been advocating fasting. Yes. You've not only advocated it, you've done it. You right. lived it. Uh, you use it as a form of protest against the war. Uh, and a, a number of us are coming around to understand, at least at the, at the rate things are going, scarcity right. combined with high prices, uh, uh, that uh, a lot of us are going to be eating what you're eating, not because we particularly believe, right. because we're not going to have any choice. For an example, there is no nutrition in granulated sugar. None at all. And the fact it's so high, people are going to stop buying it and buy honey, which is not only sweetening, but terribly Very nutritious. nutritious. Sure. Yeah. You know, well, so we're all, we're all moving toward where you have been for years. Well, see, the first fast I went on was an accident. See, that, I cannot say about spiritual reasons. You know, my wife's cooking was so bad, the first 40-day fast I went on, I gained 10 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what we're trying to do now, and there's going to be more publicity about it. This is the first time I'm making the announcement is now that we've come up with a food that I don't know that much about science. We've hooked up with a scientist now, uh, Daryl Lingham, PhD, that literally turned the food situation around in Venezuela like 35 years ago. He was able to take sesame seeds and get a 300% more yield. Now, I've had a food that I've mixed certain things together, which is the base of it being kelp. KELP, which is seaweed, which is 70 million tons laying off the Indian Ocean. Now, I ran from Chicago to Washington, D.C. at 42 years of age, drinking nothing but orange juice, fruit juice, and taking this solution, which the base of it is kelp. Now, I knew it would work, but I had to have a scientist. I found a scientist. We've been able to put it together. I have believed that the world, 2 billion people a day, could be fed three meals a day for 36 cents a day. 36 cents a day. 36 cents a day. Now, we've come up with it. We've come up with it. It's been tested. We know one of the, the ingredients used in a high, about 80 percent, sesame seeds, that now we can produce enough of this where one heaping tablespoon full would satisfy you per day. Now, I'm not saying you can go run track and run, yeah. but to keep you alive. Keep you alive. We can produce this now at five cents a day per person. There's another ingredient that have about 16 different things in it. We can produce that for a nickel to supply people. Now, what we're fixing to do now, we're going to run from New York City all the way across to Los Angeles, California, to dramatize two things. One, that there's a need for all the major governments to deal with the hungry people in the world and that this food do work. Now, I was very lucky, and this is why I have so much faith in the youth. I went and talked to a young man, 21 years old, last night, in California about the possibility of him loaning me two million dollars to sit up the run, to research the food, and to dramatize hunger. Without batting his eye, he said, I can't loan you two million dollars, but I'll give you ten million dollars for the program. And so wow. last night I left California knowing that we have ten million dollars. He said, I might have another friend that'll give ten million more. And what we're going to do with this is immediately we're going to deal with what's happening in West Africa. Immediately, we're going to deal with some problems here in America. And I also have someone that's going to pledge $2,000 per mile that I run. Now, it's 3,000 miles across the country, which means that will be $6 million when I arrive in Los Angeles, that we're going to deal. And, and we say to You're talking American, about feeding people, aren't you? Talking about feeding people, talking about raising the conscience level, because you know, John Doe citizens should not have to go around running across countries to feed hungry people. The super nations. Now, we get a lot of people talk about the third world countries. They're backwards. The reason the third world countries is underdeveloped is because of America. It's because of England. Because of, we have gone in and colonialized those places, stole their natural resources, raped them out of everything that was decent. And in the process of doing that, we never set up an agriculture system for them. We never set up an education system for them. So what we see the third world countries going through today is our fault. And I'm not going to live in this nation knowing what we are guilty of. See, it's easy to say white folks is doing it. Every time I buy a pair of socks, man, 
I pay tax to buy napalm. Every time I get on a plane, they take some of my money to buy napalm. And you know, I was kind of, I really got the, the picture when it was brought out that Nixon paid $700 income tax that year. And then it dawned on me that the same year Nixon paid $700, I paid $35,000. Now the problem is this. The on less world, income. Oh yeah, the world know that Dick Gregory was against the war in Vietnam. The world knew Dick Nixon was for the war in Vietnam. Dig this, I'm against the war, Nixon's for it. He buys $700 worth of napalm, I buy $35,000 worth. <laughs> so we're all guilty, right. and we all have to work to change it, and it's very important. Right. Okay, uh, we are uh, going to uh, be right back in one minute with uh, columnist Jack Anderson. I'm Tony Brown, executive producer and host for Black Journal. No one knows better than I about the problems of paying the costs of television productions. We have had to depend a great deal on government and corporate funds to continue bringing our audiences the kind of programming they respond to. You can help with your personal involvement by making your contribution toward the continued success and growth of programs such as Black Journal. We're depending on you. We need you. Give it out. Brave men in battle. Right, for 10 points. What have Afro-American culture, prizes, contestants, and astrology got to do with Black Journal? Well, let me tell you. This is Tony Brown, and we've put all these ingredients together into America's first Afro-American game show called Can You Dig It? I know you'll enjoy it. The questions will fascinate you. The angles are wild. How many game shows predict their winners by charting their astrological signs? It's a whole new twist. And as a bonus, we even play the numbers. We're all excited about it. I hope you'll join us for some fast action evenings with the biggest prize of all, the knowledge we gain of ourselves. Can you dig it? Another edition of beautiful Black Journal. We are now going to welcome our next guest. We all have read about him. Some of us have had the fortune to have seen him before. Ladies and gentlemen, may we welcome to Black Journal America's number one investigative reporter, Jack Anderson. take the hot seat. Greg's been in it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Before we uh, get into things that you always uh, uh, stay into, uh, you have been very interested, I've been following your columns, uh, concerning the bicentennial celebration. Just what aspect of that is it that you've been trying to develop? Well, I was, I've concerned, like, as, as Dick is, about the conditions today, about the world situation, particularly about the situation here in the United States. We've gone through the horrors of Watergate. We're now looking down a pretty bleak road at the economy. Uh, people are going hungry. They need the food at five cents or 36 cents. They need it desperately. And uh, the, the country's full of frustration and, and fear. And, well, when it, throughout our history, whenever we've had dark days, whenever we've had uh, uh, we needed our spirits lifted. Somehow there's been a slogan, uh, something to kind of lift our spirits, to pull us out of it. Give me liberty or give me death. Uh, World War II, let's remember Pearl Harbor. Uh, uh, during the Depression, Franklin Roosevelt, all we have to fear is fear itself. President Kennedy, ask not what the country can do for you, ask what you can do for the country. 
I have a dream. These things have lifted our spirits when we've needed it. So I just felt that we needed it. So I just wrote a column saying, we're about to celebrate our 200th birthday. We've got a bicentennial coming up. Uh, why don't you, well, let's not leave it to the government to celebrate it. Let's not leave it to the government to tell us what to do. Let's not leave it to the government to give us a slogan. Let's us, let's us do it ourselves. And so, you know, I got 750,000 slogans. Wow. Is that right? You got 750,000 letters, that means. Yeah, yes. People well, how long writing their slogans. Oh, it's been a couple of months, three months. Oh, so, yeah. goodness. 750, you got any, uh, any off the top of your head that you're thinking about adopting? Oh, well, we've got so many, I can't screen them. What are you going to do with the one or those that you end up with when you finally finish your well, selection process? Well, we're going to turn it over to the bicentennial and make that the slogan. Oh, I see. Let this be the slogan. Let the people come up with the slogan. We've got them from all segments of right. society, from all ages. We've got them from... Uh, we've got a lot from blacks, we've got a lot from kids, we've got a lot from women, we've got from all segments of the society. Uh, it's been rather heartening. Right. Uh, pe people are concerned. And we. Let me ask you, uh, how long would it take to screen that <laughs> amount? Well, we, because I sent one in and I know my letters under the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> how would it, could, is it humanly uh, possible to that? Uh, with the yeah, financial? Well, we've got some organizations. Oh. We've got... Uh, We've got several organizations mm -hmm. helping us screen right, them. Right. And I just see, of course, I just see some of the very best ones. Right, yeah. And there's some pretty good ones. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, <coughs> introduce... They, they just send them to, uh, to uh, Slogans USA, Box 1976 in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. Right. And they pile up. Right. We've been in the last uh, few weeks, months, uh, almost inundated with uh, revelations, uh, allegations concerning uh, the CIA's activities on, on domestic surveillance, that is, uh, activities against citizens of the United States. Now, there are a lot of details, and I'm sure we will deal with a number of them as details. How, I would like to deal with a concept. That concept basically is a fundamental approach to intelligence as a part of a democratic society. I'd just like to read um, two or three sentences from um, Marchetti, uh, Victor Marchetti and John Marx's yeah. book, The CIA and the Cult of Intelligence. And I'd like your response. Quote, the issue at hand is a simple one of purpose. Should the CIA function in the way it was originally intended to, as a coordinating agency responsible for gathering, evaluating, and preparing foreign intelligence of use to governmental policymakers, or should it be permitted to function as it has done over the years, as an operational arm, a secret instrument of the presidency, and a handful of powerful men wholly independent of public accountability, whose chief purpose is interference in the domestic affairs of other nations and perhaps our own by means of penetration agents, propaganda, covert paramilitary interventions, and an array of other dirty tricks." End of quote. Well, naturally, I'm opposed to the dirty tricks. I don't think we have any business interfering with the domestic affairs of other countries. Uh, in fact, I have been exposing that for some time. I wrote the stories that led to the big scandal about our intervention in Chile, in the domestic affairs of the Chilean government. But President the, Ford said that our interference in Chile was a matter of course. He said that in a public press conference as though... He's wrong, because we have no more right to try to interfere with the economy in Chile, sure. to undermine the economy in Chile, because we don't like the president of Chile. Right. We got no more right to do that than they than the Chileans have to undermine our economy in order to overthrow uh, President Ford. I think what he, what he mentioned, he said we sent X amount of million dollars there to neutralize uh, eight, the press. Eight million. Eight million. And you know, suppose George Wallace became president in the morning. Do a foreign country have a right to send 11 million, eight million dollars here to neutralize our yeah. press, yeah. regardless of who might be against it, you know, and, yeah, and I think this it. is, but you know, this, the frightening thing is when the President of the United States, the individual that's supposed to produce the moral leadership for an entire nation. You know, it's one thing Jack Anderson saying, I'm against it. Another thing Dick Gregory, Tony Brown saying, when the President of the United States, the, the focal moral leader of this land, can throw it off just like that, and then come back and say, yeah, if they bug us in the Middle East, we'll go to war. How are you gonna fight me over my oil, regardless to how it strangles you? if that's what it comes to. And I, I'm worried about living in a nation where I pay more for soda pop than I do for gasoline in the first place. And well, I can get more gas for a dollar than I can Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola. And so how do we justify soda pop can't run one engine 
but we pay $1.80 for a six pack. And nobody's upset over that. And I think the moral fibers of this country, and I think this is what, and I hope the slogan that is finally picked to celebrate the centennial, will deal with that. Will be a thoughtful one, yeah. yeah. Not, not, not blind patriotism, yeah, but, just, just but a thoughtful... That, that we'll deal with it, too. Well, I think, that, I, I think that, that the slide, and uh, I'd like to, I interrupted you before you, you could complete your answer, uh, but I think that the drift, the trend, is really toward something that is frightful. Uh, we've moved into and seen what the White House was turned into, a la Watergate. Uh, we, we now have seen... Uh, the three of us were on a program last year together in which you brought an, a lot of documented information yes. about thousands of black Americans who were on an FBI uh, f file, had files in the FBI. I mean, people such as Eartha Kitt and Roy Wilkins, I mean, people who... Uh, That's right. are, are, and Dick Gregory. Are, and Dick Gregory, uh, who've avowed allegiance to the country. And now we are into the CIA. He looks pretty subversive, but <laughs> after all, the, the, no, my wife of, hired him. it's none of the government's business. My it's, wife hired him. But even the latest, the, the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the latest public information regarding the, the, the 10,000 Americans that the CIA has files on includes Jack Anderson. Yes. Now, uh, what have you done to, 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 uh, been... uh, to, to merit uh, a file in the CIA? And what has Dick Gregory done to merit a file in the FBI, which also... Uh, we couldn't uh, conclude that if he has one in the FBI, they'd probably send Xerox copies over to the CIA. Of course. So w what is happening? Um, this well, is we my... embarrassed them. That's what we've done. We've embarrassed As them. We've put them on the spot. President Nixon. That's, that's all you have to do to be an enemy of the country, to embarrass all, the president. All Eartha Kitt did was to criticize the Vietnam War. And she, I thought, uh, chose the good taste of doing it right at the White House where, <laughs> where the people responsible of, uh, for it could hear it. But because she did that, she came under investigation, and the investigation consisted, and I've seen her file, and she's not opposed to my saying this, because I don't like to talk about people from their raw files without their knowledge and consent. And she's not opposed to my pointing this out. Uh, I, I got her raw file, because I have pretty good sources over there. And there was a CIA report on Eartha Kitt, and it had to do only with her sex life in Paris. It had to do with uh, her behavior in Paris. Now, this is none of the CIA's business. It's none of the White House's business. It's none of the FBI's business. So her own private life is her, is her life, and the, and, and the government has no right to go into it. As far as I'm concerned, yes, I've embarrassed the CIA. There are others like Dick Gregory who have embarrassed them. Some of his jokes, get, they strike right at home, and they don't like it. They don't like his sense of humor. Have you that seen the my rest files? of us enjoy. <laughs> Have you seen the raw stuff in my get files? It for you. Please send it, it to me. <laughs> Please. I mean, uh, uh, listen. I need it. Listen, there is a. Uh, there, there, there is a. Uh, I've seen many of them, and yeah. I've picked. Uh, you know. Just I mean, is, pick, there, is there anything the juicy in Dicks that uh, that, 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 that haven't hit the front page of the New York Times yet? I need it. Here, I'm in the middle of, of my biography, nigga. They're fixing to do it into a movie, and they say it's not exciting enough. <laughs> so if you can find anything juicy in this, send it to well, me. Well, the point is, as far as the CIA is concerned, Dick, Tony, the point is that it's against the law. Sure. It's against the law for them to conduct surveillance or conduct investigations of American citizens here in the United States. Now, lawlessness by the government, gee, that's intolerable. We can't permit that. We've got to oppose it. And, of course, as we, as we spoke when we were here a year ago, the, 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 the disturbing thing is that there's even racial bias in their investigations. Uh, we went through the FBI files. When I say went through them, I had sources check them out. And there wasn't a, a prominent black leader who doesn't have a file on him. And the only possible reason for it is because he's black. Sure. And because the late J. Edgar Hoover sure. was afraid of him. Hmm. I mean, you have, you have blacks who were supporting Nixon, his friends who were on Wilkins. his enemies list. Yes. You have entertainers. I mean, there, there's no logic other than the fact that, no that they were black and they were someone who uh, was prominent in one way or the other. And, and, the, and the material, you know, you pick up an FBI file and, uh, that begins, and, and I did pick up right. one that began, uh, this individual is not under uh, FBI investigation. <laughs> Why have they got a file on him then? Now, the alleged... Um, Houston plan that was that was concocted in the White House uh, that allegedly set up this almost Gestapo force was the result of the concern about quote young white radicals and black radicals or black militants is that am I paraphrasing that generally in an accurate way 
Yes, they were. Namely, they, the Panthers, I believe. They were, were afraid of the Black Panthers. Well, and, uh, in, in other words, is, is this new domestic surveillance a response to almost a paranoia about black people? I think it was about white people as well. But, but uh, certainly, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, when he was alive, seemed to have a, a special fear, a particular sensitivity to black power and to black uh, uh, movement in the ghettos. And almost any black leader who emerged who dared to speak up uh, wound up in the FBI files. And that, that, is, that is a horrendous abuse of power. You said in one of your columns that you had evidence that there was some relationship between the Black Panthers and foreign powers. That is true. There is. Uh, I've investigated it per, pretty thoroughly. When I say between the Black Panthers, I mean individual members of the Black Panthers. I don't know enough about their organization. I understand. I understand. But uh, there were Black Panthers who were very close to Qaddafi in, Li in Libya and uh, who received training there. And there were other Black Panthers who went to North Korea and received training there. And there were Black Panthers who had some ties to foreign terrorist organizations in Paris. So there's, there's no question that there was at least perhaps a legitimate, in the, in the case of the Black Panthers, a legitimate uh, reason for the CIA to kind of keep a watch on them overseas. When a Black Panther went overseas, if he, if he goes to North Korea, as some of them did, for training in in uh, sabotage, things like that. That probably comes within the scope of what we, you would say was a legitimate CIA concern. But uh, the NAACP here in the United States, you know. Now you, if I would go to, to North Vietnam, say when the war, and be trained in, in, in sabotage, is that a violation of our Constitution here? No, but I think that there would be, I think that the CIA would have a legitimate oh, no, I'm, reason to be concerned. I'm not saying that. I'm trying to say if it is, I would wonder why they weren't arrested and apprehended when they came back or why no, it wasn't exposed. It's not a violation. Oh, that's why I, I didn't know if legally. It's not a violation, but, the, but it's reason for concern. Oh, I can see that. Speaking now, what the CIA ought to do, in my opinion, of course, is to stick to its knitting. It has no business investigating American citizens. It has no business meddling in the affairs of foreign countries. But it does have some reason, some justification uh, for being the eyes and ears of the United States abroad. After all, we don't live in a perfect world. Mm -hmm. The millennium is not here. Right. Any lambs of my acquaintance, I'd have to mm -hmm. advise not to lie down alongside a lion's <laughs> just yet. <laughs> and because we do live in an imperfect world, our security does require that we know a little bit about what goes on. Uh, in that respect, the CIA does a, does a remarkably good job. Uh, their technology is probably the best in the world. All right, now in one uh, Senate testimony, I believe it was the Senate, a director, I don't recall the specific director, they've changed so much at the CIA in the last few years, uh, testified that they had never carried out any covert activity that was not sanctioned by a legitimate governmental body. Now, the, 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 the theory is that that body is the 40 committee which I think during uh, Johnson was called the 35-12 group, yes. which was the name of the order, executive order that created yes. them, which the now committee currently, of Committee of 40, which is under now Henry headed Kissinger. under Henry Kissinger. Uh, also, Henry Kissinger is setting the foreign policy. Uh, also, Henry Kissinger is chairman of the National Security Council. So are we talking about Henry Kissinger when we talk about the activities of the CIA? I think in fairness to Henry Kissinger, I'd have to report that uh, the CIA meddling in the affairs of Chile, for example, was resisted at first by Kissinger. But in the end, he approved it. In the end, I think he ha has to accept the responsibility for it because he's chairman of that group. But in fairness to him, he does, there are other members of the committee. Well, when a man and, in and, Kissinger's... And uh, it was the military members of the committee who were pushing for some of this meddling, some of these dirty tricks that we've talked about. And actually Kissinger rather resisted or rather questioned these things, according to my sources on the committee. But in the end, Kissinger went along, in the end he approved it, and he therefore has to well, accept I, I would, I didn't, I, I didn't say that to, to indict uh, Kissinger one way or the other. Uh, I said it to, 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 to frame when Henry Kissinger makes a statement with that much accumulated power. It's not just Tony Brown saying what he thinks. For an example, oh, when Henry right. Kissinger says that I will not rule out, America will not rule out going to war in the Middle East over oil, 
then if you're an oil potentate, you better pay attention. You better pay attention to the CIA. I'm, yeah. The point I'm making, uh, not just looking for a, an invasion, there are other things that can happen to you. That's, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm really, that's what concerns me as a citizen. That's a lot of concentration of power. But don't you think we simplify it, it? Because it have to go back before Kissinger. You know, we get an information now where, where, uh, where files were kept on people, the CIA doing domestic uh, you know, intelligence in the 11. early 60s. So I think, you know, but uh, what frightens me is the connection point that it can start over here and lead from one administration to the other without a break in it. Now, that's what's more dangerous to me than if it just started <laughs> under Nixon. You know, you know, they say, well, blacks was just being spied on by the CIA under Dick Nixon. But now we see it runs all the way back through LBJ and all the way back to Kennedy. Right. Now, what is that fine thread that holds that together regardless to who's in? What do you believe, Dick? I believe it's just a super big conspiracy. I believe the CIA controls the whole country myself, that presidents come and go. I do, and I mean this. And I think if we get to the bottom of this, let me show you two letters I received, one from Vice President Rockefeller, and one from President Ford's office. Now, <clears throat> I have to differ with you when you say that they swap information. Uh, the CIA sends stuff to the FBI. Uh, the White House called my house not too long ago to ask my wife what was my address. Now, <laughs> and so evidently the CIA and the FBI don't cut the White House in on nothing, right? Now, I sent a telegram to the President on December 25th. Now, the CIA domestic intelligence in this country surveillance on citizens is known. And I asked the president that, one, would you please look into some very important matters when you set up your commission? One is how did the CIA receive their financing for their American operation? Now, we know how we get it for the foreign operation. But now we're talking about a multi-million dollar, if not billion dollar, hustle in this country. Now, where did that money come from, which leads into can we have a thorough investigation to see if there's any connection with the hard drugs in this country? Now, we do know that hundreds of millions of dollars of heroin was smuggled into this country during the Vietnam War, sold up inside the bodies of dead American servicemen. And I was so outraged that the flag wavers, the patriotic folks, didn't demand a thorough investigation. Because that's just not no slick pimp mentality sergeant that can cut open them dead bodies, stuff them with heroin, sew them back up, ship them across the Pacific, and meet them when they get over here and take the heroin out of their bodies. Is this the way they're getting their finance? I also want to know what connection is the CIA, have they infiltrated the news media? Have they infiltrated labor? And it's very important because if the CIA tells me that they're so worried about me, that they got to have a file on me, and about you, then they have to be worried about the mafia. Now, can they really infiltrate the civil rights movement and various hippie organizations and not have infiltrated the mafia? And I think that, you know, this, and this is what the telegram, in conclusion of the telegram, I said to the President of the United States that I have some information in my presence that might could shed some light or connect Watergate with JFK getting shot in Dallas. And I also have some information that beyond a shadow of a doubt would say that Sirhan Sirhan is not the lone assailant of shooting Robert Kennedy. Now, I know there have to be a law for me to sit up in the middle of an investigation and send a lie telegram to the president and say I have information if I haven't. Now, I would expect a letter back, which I did. I received the first letter from Nelson Rockefeller that said the president had asked him to write me. Uh, we have this committee. We're going to do a thorough job. Well, I got kind of upset over that because they didn't ask for the material. And, <laughs> and I hadn't heard from the White House. I, you know, then I get a letter later from the White House uh, from the President's Council saying, we have it, we've turned the telegram over. Now, what I have is a picture which has been circulated. The, a lot of people say that one of the individuals on the picture looked like Sturgis, one of the individuals on the picture looked like Hunt. I'm not saying that it is Sturgis or it is Hunt. But I'm saying if Jack Anderson gets shot tonight and there is three people arrested and one of them looked like me, then that should be thoroughly investigated because Dick Gregory travels every day and have a certain amount of power. If Sturgis 
Belong at one time a CIA operative, if E. Howard Hunt was with the CIA, and if there's something that goes down in Dallas and one of them looked like somebody that was involved with the CIA, that is too much power for that not to be thoroughly investigated. Dick, let me see if I can follow you. Up. Let me see if I can follow you. You brought a picture with you. Right. And you are saying that the two men circled in the picture have some resemblance to two people who are well known. You're not saying that's who they are. I'm not saying that's who they are. You're saying that's who they are. But you're saying that there should be an investigation to see if those two men behind, who was that uh, that was arrested? Was that uh, Oswald? The man that they were walking behind? No, no, that was a guy who looked like Oswald. Oh. Which is also very important because there's been many prominent people in this country that have talked about the two Oswald theories. Well, who is that? Where is that picture taken? That picture is taken on the Grassy Mall in Dallas. That was you know, before Kennedy was that shot? That was after he was shot. W was, was, men, was this man in front under arrest? No. Oh, yeah, all of them was under arrest. All three of them was arrested. Well, why were the other, the two men who were circled, why were they arrested? Well, they were all circled. I'm just showing that, you see, on, this picture had been in circulation for years. Matter of fact, it was one of the Dallas newspapers run the picture, Houston newspaper. But until Watergate and Sturgis and, and E. Howard Hunt, was photographed, nobody had anything to compare it with. Again, no, I'm not saying it's them. I said, but the look-alike is close enough to say that it should be thoroughly investigated because if it one million billions of a trillion happened to be them, then we got a different ball game going on. Let me ask a, a question uh, to uh, Mr. Anderson. Um, in one of your columns, you published a memorandum uh, allegedly uh, written by Secretary of State Kissinger to President then Nixon in which you reveal uh, the foreign policy strategy of America toward black Africa or toward the continent of Africa. And I believe in it that there was, there was a little uh, foot shuffling or double talk. Could you elaborate on that? Well, this was uh, uh, his National Security Memorandum number 39, in which he advocated certain policies, certain options toward uh, our relations with Africa. And then he very secretly chose option number two. Uh, he did that in a secret memorandum that went directly to the president and only a handful of people ever saw it. We have a copy of it. And that copy shows that he, that Henry Kissinger recommended uh, option number two. And that clearly was the option that was adopted. Now that option was a tilt toward white Africa. Uh, what uh, option number two advocated was uh, a relaxation of restrictions against Rhodesia and South Africa, not a sale of, of open sale of military arms to South Africa, but a sale of civilian equipment that might be usable for military purposes. Uh, several other things like the uh, retaining uh, uh, a consulate in, in Salisbury, Rhodesia. All of these things advocated at the same time uh, giving aid to black Africa. Uh, secretly, we were supposed to favor white Africa, but publicly it, it, s sympathize and support with black Africa. It was a devious policy, should have been exposed, and we exposed it. And that now is currently our foreign policy toward Africa. Is well, that it, what was, you're it, it has been. Uh, we've done all those things. We sold uh, military planes to South Africa. Kissinger tried to keep open the consulate, but the consulate was accredited to the British. In other words, they made the arrangements for us in Rhodesia, and the British finally forced us to close it, but Kissinger tried to keep it open. Uh, we sold uh, 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 707s to Portuguese under the former military regime to support their colonies in black Africa, or in white Africa. Uh, this, this was evidently Henry Kissinger's policy. More than evidently, this is the policy we followed, which was kind of a quiet support for the South Africa and Rhodesia and the Portuguese colonies while we were making public noises about supporting black Africa. We have a, a, a few minutes left, and I'd like to ask you to deal with one thing specifically. Is there any information that you have that you have not revealed concerning intelligence, domestic intelligence activities against black Americans? I can't recall anything. I, I know that I wrote at the time. See, I've been investigating this for several years, for the past uh, oh, three years. I've been getting into the files of the FBI, the Secret Service, the, the uh, CIA, 
to show and to dramatize from actual excerpts from the files to dramatize that they were spying on people whom they had no business to spy on, that they were watching over our shoulder. And I was appalled and wrote at the time, three years ago, about the special attention they were given black leaders. Now this, uh, first place, it's wrong to investigate people, fellow Americans who have never committed any crimes and aren't likely to commit any crimes. Uh, that, it, uh, that alone is intolerable. Do you feel that the exposure of it will, have, will make any difference? Well, you it's, it's beginning to have an I effect. I think so. Uh, it's beginning I, to have an effect. I, what I would like to know, the FBI now have admitted that they have spied on senators and congressmen and congresswomen's sex life. Now, I think that not what's in it should be exposed, but the names that they have should be exposed because I don't want a senator or congressman or congresswoman in a position to have to investigate the FBI or the CIA if they have something dirty on them. <laughs> I think this is very important. That's, That's why I think it's important. I think it's important that we get the names of the organizations that the CIA was spying on and the names of the people. Then the American people can see how silly it was. How, how can you worry about this person over here? Unless well, if you want to know how silly it is, uh, I got the file or excerpts from. I can't say I had the whole file, but I got excerpts from, from a file that the FBI kept on a fellow named Gerald Ford. <laughs> I'd watch him myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, it's just very, very, very... What, what faith do you have in the Rockefeller uh, investigation? Very, very well, uh, he, uh, he's been very close to the intelligence community. He supported the intelligence community. He's part of the intelligence community. I, I think that he will try to bend over backwards to do a fair job, but I'm always concerned when... The, you call upon the fox to investigate the chicken coop. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, can we thank our guest, Mr. Jack Anderson. <laughs> and uh, certainly my very close friend, my compatriot in, uh, in certain files in certain places, my co-host, Mr. Dick Gregory. We'd like to thank you very much, uh, and particularly our very nice, responsive uh, audience in the studio, and uh, say God bless you and goodbye for Black Journal this evening. <laughs>